coming up on dtns, what qualcomm's new chips will mean for your smartphones next year, what salesforce gets out of slack, and why middle management has the most to fear from robots. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, November 2nd, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And not yawning on the show's producer, Roger Chain. <laughs> you want to know why he's saying that and get some great analysis of uh, the new M1 silicon, uh, both why it works better and Sarah salivating over how much it works better. Uh, you got to get good day internet to become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple's MagSafe Duo Charger is now on sale for $129 online. It includes a magnetic wireless charging puck for the iPhone 12 and Apple Watch. But what you don't get is a charging brick. A 20-watt USB-C adapter will get you faster charging speeds, though not as fast as a 15-watt MagSafe charger itself. Spotify announced that its podcast creation maker Anchor powered 80% of new podcasts on Spotify this year, which is more than a million shows added to Spotify's catalog in 2020 alone. Spotify says Anchor shows account for more consumption spent listening than any other third-party podcast hosting or distribution platform on its platform. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal sources say Amazon is in talks to acquire the podcast network Wondery, which a lot of people thought Apple might buy. Uh, they produce true crime podcasts like Dr. Death, Dirty John, on and over my dead body. True crime. Big podcast genre. Mm. Discovery will launch its streaming service, Discovery Plus. Yep, that's what they're all calling their subscription services. On January 4th, 2021, it'll be four, uh, $4.99 per month. That's for the ad-supported tier. $6.99 per month for an ad-free tier. Discovery is partnering with Verizon to give Verizon's 55-ish million customers up to 12 months of the ad-free Discovery Plus plan for free, depending on their wireless plan. So some people might be able to check it out without paying for a while. Discovery owns the Discovery Channel, HGTV, and Food Network, among others and is also adding content from a and &E, the History Channel, and Lifetime to offer 55,000 episodes from 2,500 shows. AWS announced the launch of industrial monitoring tools to help identify things like equipment failures, productivity bottlenecks, worker safety issues. One of the tools uses an algorithm to analyze video for anomalies, but does not use facial recognition. And another one called Panorama is an AWS hardware device that can add computer vision capability to your existing on-premises cameras. AWS also announced new algorithms to assist call center workers to gather information about the customer and answer questions faster. Well, we're getting a lot of best of the year lists is that time of year. And Apple has named Zoom the best iPad app, workout app Wakeout won best iPhone app, Disney Plus was named best Apple TV app, and productivity app Fantastical won best Mac app. Over in the Google corner, Google named Luna Bedtime Calm and Relax the best Android app, and Disney Plus was named the user choice for best Android app. All right, we promised we'd talk more about the Snapdragon 888, so that's what we're going to do right now. By the way, apparently they named it 888 instead of 875 or 885 uh, because eights are lucky, and they think that'll help sales in China. <laughs> so, hey, there you go. Good job. I hope that works for you, Qualcomm. Well, it's anyway, easy to remember anyway. Yeah. This is going to be the chip that powers most flagship Android phones in 2021, so it's important to know what it can do. It will feature Qualcomm's 8-core Cryo 680 CPU, one of the first chips to feature ARM's customized Cortex-X1 core. Uh, that promises up to 30% higher peak performance with a maximum clock speed of 2.84 gigahertz on the main core. Uh, the X1 is essentially a supersized A78 that optimizes for performance. Even so, Qualcomm expects a power efficiency rise of 25%. So more powerful chip. I don't think there's a whole lot of surprises there. First one to use Cortex-X1, so it's going to be super on performance. Maybe not as great as battery life, but Qualcomm says it'll still be 25% better than the last version. The Adreno 660 GPU promises a 35% jump in graphics rendering and a 20% improvement in power efficiency. Games will also have access to variable rate shading on this processor. That's supported on Vulkan and Unreal Engine. And for the, it's for the first time that you've had variable rate shading on a Qualcomm chip. So a little better mobile gaming. 
The five nanometer X 65 G modem with sub six gigahertz and millimeter wave support will be integrated. Now uh, everybody's been complaining about the fact that they didn't integrate it into the flagship Snapdragon. Well, now they will. That'll be five G and four G both in there. Uh, download speeds are the same as it was when it wasn't integrated up to 7.5 gigabits per second. You'll never get 7.5 gigabits per second, but it's capable of it. Uh, it also supports voice calling over 5G uh, and dynamic spectrum sharing that lets carriers run 5G calls over 4G spectrum. That's a little bit of future proofing there. The Snapdragon 888 also supports Bluetooth 5.2, Wi-Fi 6, and Wi-Fi 6E, which is good for crowded areas, uh, helps Wi-Fi work in, in areas where a lot of people are using the spectrum. The Spectra 580 image signal processor is the first triple ISP in a Qualcomm chip, can capture three simultaneous 4K HDR streams. Jeez. If you need right. to do that for some reason. <laughs> um, okay. You could also take three 28 megapixel photos at once, which, I mean, if they're all pointed the same way, anyway, you can do it. That's the point, <laughs> all right? Uh, up to 2.7 gigapixels per second in its capture rate, 35% faster than the 865, can capture 120 photos per second at 10 megapixel resolution, and shoot photos in 10-bit color in HEIF, which, yeah, iPhone users, we know you could already do that, but this will be able to do it now, too. I was uh, just thinking maybe, they, maybe you want to do a selfie and a front-facing camera at the same time or <laughs> have another That's third camera. That's true. We could already do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Unlike the Nokia, I think, could do that. So... I don't oh, know there, even why there was you... a whole social network for a while that was all about, you know, taking the photo front and back. But that I'm doesn't sure really have be... anything to do with this. No. There will be cool uses for this that we can't possibly imagine. Well, yeah. and that's why I kind of laugh because I'm like yeah. three subsamious work, 4K <laughs> HDR streams. Like, why? But that's mm. just me being like, I haven't learned yet why this is right there, something well, there's in practice the that, is really that you can then edit yeah. in and yeah all that yeah uh lastly the ai processor the six gen hexagon 780 can perform 26 trillion operations per second compared to 15 on the 865 three times better performance per watt also has the second gen sensing hub uh so that shifts some of the lower power ai onto it uh, which is things like, you know, knowing when you pick up your phone so you can light up the display. Uh, that way it doesn't use as much power by using the main Hexagon 780. Uh, there's also a Type 1 hypervisor, which can isolate data between apps and multiple operating systems on the same device. I don't know what that's going to be used for either, because you can already isolate with Android. So the operating system would be the only advantage here. And who knows what that's meant for, but intriguing multi-boot phones coming? I don't know. Uh, Snapdragon 888 chips start showing up in devices Q1 from Asus, BlackShark, LG, Meizu, Motorola, Nubia, Realme, OnePlus, Oppo, Sharp, Vivo, Xiaomi, and ZTE. But of course, the one you're going to pay attention to is the Samsung Galaxy S21 or whatever they decide to call it. I'm going to just throw out the argument that this is also, uh, you're going to see mixed reality and VR headsets use uh, this chip. Good point. Right, these yeah. chips. Yeah. And that could be the multiple thing. operating system. You could mm -hmm. you could do that. Yeah. Sure. Well, speaking of mixed reality, Varjo, if you haven't heard of the company, well, they announced a new generation of VR and AR headsets. The PC tethered VR3 and XR3 headsets use two panels for each eye. A 1920 by 1920 display in the center of your vision, and then a 2880 by 2720 panel for the rest of the screen, both with 90 hertz refresh rates. This produces a clear image straight ahead because of the greater pixel density, and the new models also have a 115-degree horizontal field of view. Bigger than most consumer-grade headsets. A lot. There's also hand-eye tracking, and the XR3 adds cameras and LiDAR to enable a pass-through video feed for augmented reality as well. The XR3 weighs... 594 grams compared to the VR3, which is 558. They're both heavier than the Oculus Quest 2, which weighs 503 grams, However, they're different. They are business and organization products, at least right now. Think a pilot who needs to be trained, somebody in telemedicine, for example, and the prices reflect that. The XR3 costs $5,495 with a required one-year 1495 Varjo software subscription. The VR3 is $3,195 with a $795 required yearly subscription. They're both available now, shipping in early 2021. Yeah, I mean, it's good to look at this stuff, though, because a lot of times what happens in the enterprise areas, which is where VR is actually very successful, trickles down to oh, what totally. we use on the consumer side. Uh, and this idea of using two different displays that have different pixel densities 
so that you can you can make a high because your peripheral vision doesn't need as high a resolution. You're not capable of seeing it as high resolution. So uh, yeah. or or high a pixel density. So yeah, that that's an interesting way of doing it, uh, and obviously great for for training of all kinds. Yeah, what's interesting I think about this and just VR development in general is those multiple screens are a sign that what what we're getting better at is creating the complexity that our own eyes experience. So how are you going to do that? The optics for the human eye are crazy complicated. It all just works, and here we are seeing stuff, but really, really complicated. So to replicate that, to re or or to replicate the the sense that you're creating objects and worlds and virtual situations that to your eye are as real as you and me standing and talking, that's the big, you know, clam in the sky. That's what we want. And this feels like them going, yeah, well, to get that, we're going to have to get weird with, with displays. And then we're going to have to get weird with this other thing. And, and by get weird, I mean innovate in ways that seem a little crazy to us now, but it makes perfect sense to me that they would start to focus on the way our eyes actually work more and more as these, as these new headsets come out. And this thing sounds fantastic, but clearly it isn't for me in my living room. That's that's not where this is going to go. Yeah, right. Not, well, yeah, and yeah I mean, anyway. there's so much yeah. of, you know, it's, you know, precision training, for example, where you go, well, of course, you know, somebody's training to, you know, be a fighter pilot needs, you know, the absolute best VR training ever. But consumers also want that great experience as well. You might not need it in a life or death situation, but it it, it will trickle down, like you said. you need it like in your flight said. simulator. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, what that, if you, that would what be if very helpful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I and would a assume... company like, you know, look at Oculus. It's like, okay, well, you know, my, I, I was only half kidding this morning where I was like, in three, two, when does Oculus buy Varjo? But that's yeah. the sort of thing where a company goes, oh, okay. Because right now, as cool as I think VR is, I'm like, eh, I mean, sometimes the visuals leave a little to be desired, but you just sort of deal with it because it's cool anyway. But yeah. when it gets to a point of a company that's doing something on this level, then we'll, you know, we'll all look back to right now and say, oh, remember that janky little thing we used to put on our heads? Yeah. I, and I've thought for a long time that augmented reality would, would and virtual reality would become one device. And this is another step in that direction by using LiDAR and external cameras to say, well, when you want augmented reality, we'll just bring it into you. And because it's doing it that way, the augmented reality is more convincing. It's able to occlude things better. It may, it's able to work it in to the image better than, than the way, say, HoloLens does it, where you have to deal with natural light. Um, so I don't know if this is the one that went out or not, but I, I think this is another indication that we're just going to have mixed reality headsets, which is why people use that term. Yeah. If I had six grand, I wonder if I could just plug this into men's It's Steam. like buying it's... a high-end Mac, right? Well, it, it is, but um, if I had it, would it just work? Like, can I play Steam games on this thing? I don't know. I don't know if there's any kind of, like, interoperability. Right, because well, you got to pay for that software subscription and all that, yeah. Oh, it's really gosh. not meant for them. Yeah. All right, well, check this out. Let's talk about a study that was meant for us. You worried about losing your job to robots? Well, yep. maybe you shouldn't worry so much. A study from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School finds that managerial jobs are more at risk of elimination due to automation than lower level employees. So think middle Crap. management, that sort of thing. The study looked at forms that purchased, or excuse me, looked at forms that purchased AI and robotic systems, firms that is, over the last 20 years in Canada. Overall, that study found that primary motivations to automate with AI and robotics was to improve product and service quality, not to save costs. Everyone assumes it means that you're gonna try to save jobs or you know, have less jobs, therefore pay out less money. Well, uh, the f study found that, uh, let's see, sorry, managers on the other hand, no longer spend as much time overseeing work hours and inspecting work and results because robotics and AI recorded these numbers faithfully and automatically. And with automated assistance, lower level workers could supervise themselves more efficiently, at least in theory. That means you needed fewer managers to oversee the same number of employees due to automation. However, because there is less demand for supervisory roles, the ability to work your way up into a better paying position was reduced. So there used to be kind of a bridge there, right? Like a little bit of a curve and you get those new jobs and build up to the next one. Some of that in the middle gets removed and now you got a bigger leap to get to the higher paying job. But you're not going to lose your job as quick as y'all feared you would or the well unless story. you're a middle manager right well, that's like yeah. uh, that's that's the thing that that stuck out to me is that and I, i've been suspecting this for a while is that companies that don't automate can't compete 
So you're more likely to lose your job at a company that doesn't add AI and robotics because it costs more to employ humans and they fall behind and those companies don't do as well and they have to lay people off. And this study found that to be true, that if you want to keep your job, you want your company to be doing automation. Uh, and I, But I did not expect that they would find that, you know what? While it doesn't eliminate the the lower level employee jobs because we either have them do other things or there's things that humans can do that robots and AI just can't do yet, uh, it's easier to supervise people when you got a lot of assistive technology with them, mm -hmm. uh, and that that gets rid of that middle management layer. Now, I imagine a lot of you out there, unless you are a middle manager, aren't going to weep too much for that because people complain about middle management all the time as being you know useless, uh, and and this kind of points out that. They may be the least useful in the chain. Well, you know, as somebody who has technically been a middle manager in a couple different uh, positions with different companies, it's not that I didn't think I did anything. I was very busy, but a lot of it was sort of busy, busy meeting work that wasn't necessarily super enjoyable and not necessarily creative on any level. And, you know, we all kind of I think we would all call ourselves, you know, in the creative industry. And so the, I think there's a lot of that. You just kind of get lost in the fold of you're not really doing the stuff that the company does, but you're not really the boss boss. You're somewhere in the middle, you know? And so there's a lot of just kind of busy work that happens. Again, depending on where you work, this could be like a very integral job that a robot could not replicate. I think probably in a couple of instances that I'm talking about, a robot could do a lot of what I was doing all the time <laughs> for 12 hours a day quite well. And, yeah. and it, yeah, it's not necessarily a thing that I'd be like, Oh, I loved that job. It was sort of like, well, you know, it's a pretty good job. But I think the most important thing is people saying, okay, if robots take jobs that are, you know, low level as in, you know, maybe the lowest pain, but they're super important jobs. Well, now, you know, those people are, they're SOL and, and that's a bad thing. And sure, having, that may happen, but having, this, this is, you know, pointing to something entirely different. Sure. I, I totally agree with that. And having a number of conversations with Tom over the years, I never forget the discussions we had about Lotus 123 and the fear that that <laughs> struck in the hearts of the accounting world at the time. And everyone was sure that meant we're all losing our jobs. The accounting world is going to be destroyed. CPAs jump ship now and find another gig because this is going to be bad. And instead, the reality was it created jobs, like way more jobs. And that business never went away. And in fact, it's, you know, money management and, and what we're able to do with the hard math being done by computers has made it so much easier for us to focus on the services and the things around accounting. So this feels like that to me. Like we'll find a way, and oftentimes what we're afraid of is actually the thing that will spark a whole new industry. And and I and I and I worry about it not at all because of the conversation I had with Tom like four years ago. <laughs> well, and if you look at the actual study here of actual companies and what they did, it looks like the problem may be advancement that you might get stuck in lower level jobs because AI and automation eliminates the path. Uh, to, to moving up. So keep an eye on that. Hey, folks, if you want to join in the conversation in our Discord, do it right now. Link your Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, we mentioned yesterday that Salesforce had agreed to acquire Slack, which pits Salesforce more directly against Microsoft Teams. That is the big competitor at this point. Microsoft and Salesforce compete in a few other areas as well but they also partner up a lot. Salesforce is slowly building a business software stack that replicates what Microsoft already offers. And Salesforce has a 20% market share in CRM. Back in 2018, it bought MuleSoft, which connects legacy IT systems to the cloud. In 2019, it bought Tableau, a data analytics platform, which up until now was one of its, its most direct competitors to Microsoft. And now Salesforce also has Slack. Slack's big advantage is integrating with enterprise software, does it already. TechCrunch suspects that, plus Slack's bots, which also integrate well, depending on what you're doing, make it the central place for Salesforce customers to work, since all of Salesforce's product, various products can integrate into Slack already. For instance, Quip, that's Salesforce's way of socially sharing documents, slots right into Slack. That integration is a risk for Salesforce if they can't pull it off probably think that they can. The other risk is Slack not being worth the money. It was a big acquisition. Slack has not benefited as much from work from home as, say, Zoom. 
teams and others. Slack reported a net loss of $147.6 million in the two quarters ending July 31st this year. Salesforce thinks it can rejuvenate Slack both with develop development resources and selling the heck out of it, which if you're not familiar with Salesforce is what the company does quite well. Yeah, I'm kind of taken by this idea that Slack becomes your Salesforce hub. Uh, they they haven't integrated everything in there, uh, and it might not all integrate well, which would be the risk that you were talking about. But if they did, that's pretty compelling to be like, hey, we've got this. We've got Slack. You all know Slack, right? We've got Slack. You just use that, and it integrates everything, all your CRM, all your right. backend stuff. It's it's just all right there. You can communicate with everybody. I get why this makes a lot of sense for Salesforce, and I get why Microsoft passed on buying Slack. Microsoft could have bought Slack when it was much cheaper, but they looked at the tools they had and said, I think we can just build it ourselves and have it do what we want it to do. Because it does a tiny, it does things a little differently than Slack. It's a little more video focused, a little more uh, Office 365 focused than Slack would have been had they just bought it. So this, that, I guess that's the challenge for Salesforce is making sure that it's Salesforce focused, but this makes sense to me. Yeah, me too. I what I hope so this is a tiny little thing that only affects me and I use Slack a lot with a lot of people including you guys. Um uh, my biggest complaint about the service is some of its more basic things that we just sort of rely on uh, rely on it for like sharing files, in particular image files, which I have to send to people all the time for approvals and like a book cover, I got to get 10 people to look at it and sign off on it so we use Slack to do it. Their image compression has been getting worse and worse and worse. So this is a small technical quibble. But I see this acquisition as potentially at least a chance for Salesforce to go, all right, well, let's evaluate everything as it's happening right now. Why is that happening? Is it because free tier people just aren't getting some of the better features like higher or, or in other words, images? Salesforce could just afford to pour pour money into research yes. and into yes. fixing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And and to me, that would be a reason for me to stick around because lately I've been like, ugh. I don't really want to use it. In fact, Discord is being used by most of the people I work with now, and they're not gamers. That's The thing was made for gamers. They don't use it for that anymore. They use it to communicate and to share messages. And while it doesn't have all the integrations maybe you would want from something like Slack or Teams, it does a decent job at a very basic level of all that. So that's where they go. And you don't have image compression issues. You don't have video compression issues. It's like it's just some of that quality of life stuff. If they could sink some money into that, rejuvenate that stuff, as part of the core Slack experience, then maybe my whole outlook on Slack changes and I'm back in their good graces because right now it just seems like kind of a bummer, some of that stuff. So I'm kind of excited about this, is I guess what I'm saying. I hope they do it. I, I mean, as somebody better. who doesn't use any Salesforce products on any regular basis, this doesn't really affect me much. Yeah, as you mentioned, Scott, we use Slack for DTNS. I use Slack even just for like casual talking to friends and sharing GIFs and, you know, just, just, friend stuff. It's really sort of a big group text that looks a lot nicer and does other things. And there are some integrations, but uh, this doesn't really scare me. I mean, sure. Lots of times when a big company buys a smaller company or a newer company anyway, both both sides of e e from each team say, don't worry, they'll run independently. Nothing will change. It's going to be the product that you've always loved, just better. That doesn't always happen. But if Slack gains a bunch of features that I may or may not use, but doesn't lose the features that I like now because it works really well for me, then I don't care that Salesforce bought Slack. Oh, I, I fully expect uh, Salesforce to want you to use Salesforce to continue to use Slack. I'm not saying they'll get rid of the free tier, but expect that free tier to change and expect the focus of Slack to shift from mm. where it is now. And probably more than just a jump off point right they're not going to want to just have it be hey come on in here and check out this free thing but also here's all our stuff it's going to be more integrated than that probably slack is going to be a thing when you buy salesforce you use this not a yeah. thing where hey use slack and then we'll try to upgrade you to a paid version that's yeah. my guess well now i'm mad <laughs> <laughs> wow mad oh. by anticipation I should uh, I should make this note uh, here about Apple. Uh, earlier this year, Apple patched an exploit discovered by Project Zero researcher Ian Beer uh, that would gain complete access to an iOS device over Wi-Fi with no user interaction required. Oof, that's a bad one. The memory uh, corruption bug existed in Apple's mesh networking protocol, AWDL. The attacker would need a Raspberry Pi, a laptop, and off-the-shelf off Wi-Fi adapters as well as be within 
Wi-Fi range of the targeted computer uh, for at least two minutes or so. Anyway, Apple patched the vulnerability in May. It was developed in the lab and was never in the wild. The so computer I, you're you're talking about is the phone, right? Or the phone, within, right? Yeah. Within, within range of the phone, right? Uh, and the this is good news. This is very good news. Let me explain why. This is somebody whose job it is to find really bad vulnerabilities, spending six months and finding a really bad vulnerability, and then reporting it to Apple. Apple fixing it before anyone else knew about it. And now it's not a vulnerability. That's what you want. That's what Project Zero exists for. That's why Google runs it. Uh, that's why you responsibly disclose so that Apple patches it. That's why you hope companies respond, which Apple did. This is everything working well. Yeah, makes me happy. I like to hear when uh, somebody out there finds a thing, no matter who they are, and uh, tells them before it can be a problem. Like, this is how we should be. There's always going to be uh, bugs and vulnerabilities and things that companies don't catch and you know this is good faith effort stuff that i wish there was more of it's fantastic and now dan gooden uh, whom i respect quite a bit at ars technica points out he's like well if ian beer could spend six months figuring this out imagine you know what a highly motivated uh state-backed team could do and mm. that's true that's something to keep in mind uh, especially if you're likely to be a target of a state-backed actor uh but this this is mostly a good good news story well, this might be a good news story, uh, depending right. on how hungry you are right now. Singapore has given the first wor world's first regulatory approval for the sale of cultured meat. U.S. company Eat Just will sell nuggets made out of lab-grown chicken meat under its Good brand. The meat is grown from actual chicken muscles cells, so it's meat but it's obtained without killing those animals. The first sales will be at premium prices at a restaurant in Singapore in the very near term, says the company. Several other companies are developing cultured meat as well, including Singapore's Shiok Meats, making cultured shrimp, and U.S.-based Memphis Meats. Mm, I would eat all this meat, no problem. Me too. Bring it on. We talked about it on TMS a little bit with Tom, and I just want to reiterate, if it tastes like chicken and it looks like chicken, and I don't mean it needs to be like a full chicken with the legs on it and all that. I don't mean that. But, you know, looks like I've got a, some chicken on my plate, nugget or otherwise, and it tastes like chicken. This is great. All for this. Let's do it with cows next. Let's cut down on methane. Let's get less chickens being slaughtered by the billions. Let's just have a couple of cells and grow it from mm -hmm. there. I've been in for this for years. And finally, it might happen. Yeah, it's minimally invasive, too. It's like a biopsy to get the cells out. Uh, some people say, like, yeah, but it still encourages meat eating. And since we don't have most of our meat grown in the lab, uh, that might be bad. But but really, this 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 is a, a good move for being able to more sustainably uh, create our meat. We'll find out if there are any other downsides to it. But the reason Singapore is first on this is Singapore only makes 10% of its food. And they want to increase that. They want to make more of their meat in the country, and they don't have room to grow a bunch of chickens, so this would allow them to get there. Let's see what's in the mailbag. Well, we wanted to um, have a little bit of an anniversary party. Mike McLaughlin <laughs> wrote us and said, it just so happened today, December 2nd, to be the 22nd anniversary of my 25th birth birthday. <laughs> Yeah, so I was like, 22nd anniversary. I see what you're doing, Mike. Got it. Uh, happy 25th birthday again. And uh, yeah, you're uh, one of our uh, uh, master grandmasters. Uh, My, we know your Mike name McLaughlin well. Mike McLaughlin turning 25 for the 22nd time. Let's Whoa, hear Mike. Geez, I mean, what amazing. a milestone. Right. Uh, yeah. By the way, uh, this was Mike's uh, request for a recorded uh, announcement that you get at a certain level on our Patreon, uh, which is why we're able to do this for you. And uh, thank you, Mike, for supporting us for, for so long. Uh, appreciate that. Happy birthday, my friend. Yeah, Feliz Cumpleaños. Uh, if you have feedback of any kind, you want to tell us when your birthday is, we, we'll take it. Or if you have questions or comments about anything that we talk about on the show, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. We also want to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today they include Philip Less, Dan Kolbeck, and Chris Benito. Also thanks to Scott Johnson. Scott, I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and what's been, what's been going on? Well, I did. I had a really nice Thanksgiving, and we had an amazing turkey. I recommend smoking your turkey next time you do it. And as a result, it gave me ideas for my comic strip that I do every week called Fred and Can. Yeah, that's right. A guy who lives with a can of expired cream corn in an apartment and their adventures together. And the latest one deals with a Warcraft hangover. 
Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. I anyway, can't imagine that was ripped from your own experience. Somehow. <laughs> it feels like it might be. Uh, you'll have to decide for yourselves. Go check it out. It's over at fredandcan.com. And for everything else you need from me, you can find it at frogpants.com. Now, listen, folks, I'm just talking to you right now. Okay. Nobody else. Just, just you. So play it cool. You know, I know that you got your headphones in. I want to send you a holiday card. Oh. Now, if you don't want me to, that's fine. But if you do, I need your address. So go to patreon.com slash pledges, find DTNS if you back more than one patron, and just make sure that address is there and it's correct. If it's not, you can click update, you can add it. If it's not correct, you can click edit. And if you do that by December 10th, I will send you a holiday card. Now, if you're not a patron and you're like, wait, I want a holiday card, well, go sign up and make sure you put in your correct address at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Folks, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>